Time Warner Cable is pleased to be an underwriting sponsor for Carolina Week. Coming up on the April 26th edition of Carolina Week. I'm Andrea Blanford. Are you still looking for a summer internship? You're not out of luck yet. We'll introduce you to two UNC doctoral candidates turning academic research into entrepreneurial success. In sports, we have recaps of five ACC tournaments, and you don't want to miss the best highlights of the semester. Weathercaster John Boyer will tell us if we're out of the woods from this weekend's storms. All that and a campus group that puts smiles on the faces of young hospital patients. Carolina Week starts right now. From the James F. Goodman Studio in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, connecting campus and community, this is Carolina Week. Graduation is only a couple of weeks away, and the internship hunt is in high gear. Good evening. I'm Lauren McGaha. And I'm Chris Neal. Thanks for joining us. Will graduating seniors and students returning be able to find jobs and internships for the summer? We turn now to Andrea Blanford, who's live in our studio, for the answer to that question. Andrea, what's the scoop? Chris, you might think with the economy just beginning to recover, internships, especially paid internships, would be hard to find. But that's not the case. Assistant Director for Business-Related Internships Gary Miller says there's been a break in the trend for summer internships. The, the posting numbers now are actually higher than they were in February, which is really unusual. Normally after spring break, it takes a nosedive. Right now, UCS has nearly 400 internship opportunities posted. That's 200 more than in February. Miller says communications management and marketing are currently the peak industries for recruiting interns. He says businesses were probably holding off with economic uncertainties, but after their first quarter, business is beginning to pick back up. They're all up. kind of waking up from their slumber and starting to say, hey, we need to get some talent in here to help us. Miller says although both paid and unpaid internships are out there, most deadlines for university-funded stipends and other forms of financial support have passed. Some students say although financial aid would ease the burden, internships are sometimes rewarding enough to work for free. Have like a job, you know, being a waitress or something, um, where you're getting money if you need, you know, if you need to make money in the summer, but then in your spare time kind of do an unpaid internship. It's such an incredible opportunity to get to do something that you love, regardless of whether or not it is paid. Miller says the experiences are out there and the odds could be in your favor. So not only should you definitely stay engaged, your, your potential of, of getting a really good one may even be higher because competition's lower. So even if you've been procrastinating, you still have a shot at getting an internship this summer. But you probably won't be able to get financial aid from the university. Okay, Andrea, are there any other financial aid resources for students working unpaid internships? Actually, Chris, Miller says there might be some untapped funds out there, and students are advised to check the funding link on the UCS website just in case there are some rolling deadlines. All right, that's Andrea Blanford starting us off tonight live in our studio. Thanks, Andrea. With just a few precious days left before graduation, Carolina seniors are soaking up the view from the top of the bell tower, that is. Graduating seniors took the 172-foot climb to the top of the bell tower Friday. The Moorhead-Patterson bell tower has been around since 1931 and is one of Carolina's most recognizable historic symbols. The senior bell tower climb has been a UNC tradition for more than 15 years now. Seniors took their spots in the long line to climb the tower, and some even left their marks. The chiming bells were a bittersweet reminder that their time here at Carolina is coming to a close. Former Representative Tom Tancredo's visit to campus last year erupted in a national controversy. Tonight, he's back to finish his speech. Last year, the campus group Youth for Western Civilization invited Tancredo to speak about illegal immigration, but the speaker left abruptly when an outburst of violence resulted in police force and mace against the crowd. Students plan to protest Tancredo's return to campus, saying he spews right-wing hate speech. Tancredo is scheduled to speak tonight at 7 in the Student Union Auditorium. Does Chapel Hill have the fastest internet in the world? Not quite, but according to a recent survey by Acklin Akamai Technologies, Chapel Hill does have the second fastest average broadband speed in the world. Berkeley, California just edged out Chapel Hill to take the top spot, while Stanford, California came in third. The next closest U.S. city on the list is Durham, which ranks eighth. Of the top ten U.S. locations, all are home to major universities. PhD candidates work hard conducting academic research and now some are taking their work beyond the classrooms and labs and are turning it into entrepreneurial success. Julia LaRoche joins us from our satellite studio. Julia, putting research into practice is the ultimate goal, right? 
Lauren, it is, and two doctoral candidates in the hard sciences could become known worldwide for the practical application of their academic work. As a PhD candidate in molecular pharmaceutics, Michael Hackett solves problems every day, and he's helped find a solution to a problem that affects millions of Americans. He discovered a way to make current cancer drugs safer and more effective and turn this idea into a business opportunity called Novolipid. So what we do is we can take anti-cancer drugs and we'll chemically modify them with a special lipid that we designed. And that's where the name of the company comes from, Novolipid. So what does Novolipid's technology mean for cancer patients? We can make the drugs safer. We can make them less toxic. So uh, you may have to go in for chemo less often and hopefully you'll have a higher chance of coming out disease-free. Hackett had a major discovery on his hands, but he needed the right element to take this idea to the next level. After enrolling in a business course, he met PhD candidate Deepak Gopalakrishna, who was able to add an edge to the project. Both would agree their working relationship has been nothing short of a positive reaction. It's been great. I mean, I think we have a great working relationship. Um, he, you know, he does the science, and I, which I know a little bit, a little about, and I know what the technology does and what it's capable of doing. But uh, um, yeah, uh, the division of labor is great. Together, Hackett and Gopalakrishna incorporated Novolipid and developed a business plan. For these guys, it's not about the money. It's nice to make money and everything for the company, but really we want to, the whole goal of the company is to, to increase the quality of life for cancer patients. As they finish their PhDs, they know they'll have something extra special to take away from their time at Carolina. Gopalakrishna and Hackett will complete their PhDs this year and both plan to continue to work with Novolipid. Now, Julia, this sounds like a major breakthrough. What's the next step for them? Lauren, you're right. Novolipid has already secured a provisional patent, and in January they hope to have a full patent. They're currently seeking more funding so they can eventually make some major deals with top pharmaceutical companies. All right, best of luck to them. That's Julia LaRoche in our satellite studio. Thanks, Julia. Many people who are HIV positive struggle to pay for medications that are crucial to their health. Three years ago, this Winston-Salem man was taking three handfuls of meds a day until he can no longer afford them. His story is next. Hey, Sarah. Oh, my gosh, this is so cute. How do you know, him? Come on, Donovan, do it like I taught you. Love the new tattoo, Sarah. Let's go! Dude, what? Dude, that's Sarah. Hey, Sarah. The girl in the pink shirt, that's the girl I was telling you about. Oh, that's Sarah? Theater two on your left. Hey, Sarah. What color underwear today? Sarah, so when you want to post something new? Anything you post online, anyone can see. Family, friends. See you later, Sarah. Even not so friendly people. Think before you post. The CDC estimates more than 13,000 North Carolinians were living with HIV in 2007. Health reporter Larissa, Lisa Marie Albert says the proposed state budget sets aside $14 million for ADAP, the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, to help low-income residents pay for HIV medications. That's good news for people like Richard Cassidy of Winston-Salem because expensive HIV medications helped save his life. At one point, cancer was all over my face. It had consumed my left lung, my heart, uh, and, and that was due to not being able to get the HIV medications. As Cassidy's cancer got worse in 2006, he said his medical treatments cost one and a half million dollars in a period of six months. But medications can help control HIV, says UNC Dr. Peter Leone, who directs the state's efforts against the spread of the virus. We can turn now HIV into a chronic, lifelong disease. We know that people live 20, 30 years, if not longer, if their virus is well controlled with the medication. This is no longer a death sentence. It is something that you can live with, hopefully return back to work, and, and to have a productive life. 
It's cheaper to treat HIV patients with medications early in their disease rather than wait for complications leading to costly hospitalizations later. And by benefiting them, we benefit the society as well. These are folks who can stay healthy, stay out of the hospital, so we reduce medical costs. They also stay productive, tax-paying citizens. Now that Cassidy has regained his health, he's hoping to return to work. He shares about his recovery through a poem he wrote. Broken, beaten, and still singing, standing on the faith of the lover of my soul, hallelujah rings. Cassidy can say hallelujah because he now Three takes only a six pills so a day. Some people with HIV can get, get by with only one a pill a day. In Chapel Hill, I'm Lisa Marie Albert, Carolina Week. Now, if the state legislature approves the additional funding, ADAP can open enrollment again, and that's definitely good news for the 400 people on the wait list. A new program aimed at fighting local poverty is offering some members of Chapel Hill community to step up. A large crowd showed up at Hope Garden's ribbon-cutting event on Saturday. Chapel Hill's Park and Rec teamed up with the Hope organization to create the gardens on Homestead Road. The purpose of the community gardens is to provide a transitional employment opportunity for homeless participants. Guests toured the garden, participated in workshops, listened to speakers, and ate lunch. There are already three homeless people getting stipends to tend their own plots in the garden. UNC, Duke, and Elon students don't often play well together, but physical therapy students and volunteers from the three universities cycled for a worthy cause this weekend. Different Shades of Blue were on the same team in Keenan Stadium for the Bikeability Clinic on Saturday. From helmet safety to new bike designs and even face painting, various booths offered fun and hands-on information for disabled children and adults. Even a few special characters came out to join the fun. Physical therapy professor and bikeability organizer Debbie Thorpe wants to expand the unique event and says it gives special opportunities to people who once only dreamed of riding a bike. Many of them are weak, uh, they can't pedal, their balance might not be good, they might not have enough attention or focus to be able to ride a bike out in the community, and so they never learn how to. Bikeability organizers plan to expand the program within Alamance and Orange Counties. We all know Facebook is a powerful tool for staying in touch. Bethany Tuggle introduces us to a local college student who used Facebook to reunite with a family member she hadn't seen in more than a quarter of a century. Jenny LaRocco is a 26-year-old paralegal student. Jenny was born with cerebral palsy and is in a wheelchair. She faces the daily challenges of trying to be independent and the repercussions of being separated from her biological family. When she was 11, social services took Jenny from her mom and placed her in foster care. She never knew her dad. I always knew that he was out there and that something was missing and I always knew that I wanted to find him. She would search the internet for him, typing his name again and again, never finding anything, until recently. Jenny was checking her Facebook messages one day when she saw there was one from a man named James LaRocco. It was her dad. She says it was an unbelievable moment. I was shocked. I was, like, I wanted to cry, but I didn't, I couldn't cry because I was so, sh so shocked that I didn't know what to do. James says there were mixed emotions as he prepared to contact the daughter he hadn't seen in 26 years. What am I gonna say? Is she gonna accept me? What does she look like? Where is she? You know, it was like confusing, awestruck, and completely amazed at the same time. This father and daughter are now trying to make up for those years apart, talking all the time, either through Facebook or on the phone. It's me, Jenny. <laughs> this summer, they'll finally get to see each other in person. It's going to be very exciting. I'm going to hug her a lot. And he says now that he's found her, he'll never let her go. I love you. I love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. In Durham, I'm Bethany Tuggle, Carolina Week. Reporter Bethany Tuggle is very familiar with Jenny's story as that is actually her adopted sister. The family is delighted that Jenny has found her birth father. And it's springtime, we get the nice spring temperatures, but with that comes a few storms and some high winds. That's right, reporter, uh, weathercaster John Boyer is here to tell us more about the weather this week. Uh, that's right, there was a small tornado in uh, eastern Wake County yesterday afternoon. We'll recap that after the break, but I don't think we're any expecting anything that severe either this evening or tomorrow evening. So I'll have the full forecast in 90 seconds. Si 
el hermoso bosque es lo que deseas. No juegues con fósforos. No juegues con fuego. Solo tú puedes prevenir los fuegos forestales. ¡Fuego! Ever think about buying a bigger place? Just waiting for a visit from the credit fairy. There is no credit fairy. How else will I get a better credit score? Look, you keep your credit card balances low and only open a new card if you really need it. No fairy? There's no magic to improving your credit, but there's help, and it's free. Go to creditfairy.org. Welcome back to Carolina Week. I'm John Boyer. I mentioned that tornado before the break. I'll recap that in just a second. But the rest of your forecast will include some temperatures going down and then coming back up, swinging around, and then some more rain in sight for the weekend. It's not the best of news, but I thought I'd start with this look at the yesterday's satellite picture, yesterday's visible satellite picture around 7.30 last night. Here's this lone wolf thunderstorm over central North Carolina moving through Raleigh, and as it moved to the east a few minutes later, it dropped a tornado in eastern Wake County. Now, here are some of the specifics. The National Weather Service sent out a damage survey team this morning. It rated it an EF0 strength, which is minimal as far as tornadoes are concerned, with 80-mile-an-hour winds. The track was about three and a half miles long, and the good news is that there was only minimal damage and no deaths or injuries reported. Now this radar product will show us where the rotation went uh, from the storm yesterday evening. And here's the city of Raleigh, and here's where Rocky Mount is. So these brighter, warmer colors show where that uh, rotation and possible tornado moved through. And the first report came in around 8 o'clock in Zebulon, North Carolina, in the very eastern part of Wake County. Wake County's first tornado in three years, actually. And some people took these photos and uploaded them in videos to YouTube. So you can do a little searching and find some very dramatic pictures. And the storm moved off to the northeast through the southern parts of Franklin County and into Nash County. And that's when it lifted up. So as far as tornadoes go, that wasn't too bad. We're very lucky so far this April as that was the only tornado this month in North Carolina. There are some storms out to the east of us right now, but none of them are severe, none of them dropping any tornadoes as they're moving east of Rocky Mountain to Greenville and weakening. And now there are a few more showers off to our west past Greensboro and in Moore County, and they're also moving to the south and east. So keep the umbrella handy this evening as you may have some showers to dodge. The satellite picture just shows some broken cloudiness over the Carolinas. So it'll take a little bit before we can actually get some true sunny skies into our forecast. Causing that right now on the surface map is uh, here's yesterday's cold front that pushed through. That triggered yesterday's tornado, but behind it there's another trough that'll push through uh, and be the trigger for some more showers and thunderstorms tomorrow night. Tonight's forecast, partly cloudy skies, 52 degrees with some light westerly winds. Tomorrow heating up only to around 70. That's cooler than today, but watch out for some scattered afternoon thunderstorms. Hopefully none will be too severe with some more northwesterly winds. Tomorrow's surface map just goes to show here more showers and thunderstorms pushing through, but behind that some clear skies. Baseball game, we got high point 6 o'clock tomorrow here at home. 67 degrees will be your temperature and partly cloudy skies with an isolated storm. And the good news for your other outdoor activities is that the pollen trend is on its way down. We're high today going into the mid-ranges as we progress through the week. So we have clear skies for us finally on Wednesday and Thursday, partly cloudy for Friday, and then our next weather maker comes in late in the weekend, bringing some more thunderstorms for Sunday and Monday. Temperature trend also starting out rather cool and below average right now, but warming up quite a bit as we head into the uh, weekend. Temperatures perhaps in the mid to upper 80s, but morning lows are also going to be below normal here these next two mornings. So if you have an 8 a.m. class, be sure to bring the jacket just one last time. I'm looking forward to those summer temperatures, though. All right, and good luck to finals for everybody. All right, thanks, thanks John. John. Ice cream and running probably aren't the best mix, but the combination of the two did help raise money for Norwich International this weekend. The organization hosted the Maple View Challenge on Saturday. Participants ran about two miles, some even in costume, and took a break in the middle to eat a pint of Maple View ice cream. It was a tasty treat for everyone. Winners of the race received prizes, and so did those with the best costumes. Proceeds from the challenge will go towards sustainable development projects in, cost in communities abroad. And moving on to sports, you know, Simone, it's been uh, it's been great watching our former Tar Heels play in the NBA Finals this week. You can see why we have so many ACC titles. And a lot of the, Simone Scott joins us in the studio. A lot of us are still playing for some ACC titles. A lot of contenders this year. That's right. There's still the ACC tournaments going on, and we take a look back at that last weekend. After the break, five teams participated in the ACC championship this weekend. Fortunately, the resounding sentiment, we were oh so close.
event of a car crash, three out of four kids are not as secure as they should be because their car seats are not used correctly. But the latch system makes it easier to get it right and to hold your kids tight. Anchor, tether, latch. Learn more at safercar.gov. We got the spirit, we're hot, we can't be stopped. We got the spirit, we're hot, we can't be stopped. We're gonna beat them and bust them. Beat them. The smallest them. moments can have the biggest beat impact beat on a child's life. Take time to be a dad One more today. Time. All those boys are much too much. Those boys. Welcome to Carolina Week Sports, I'm Simone Scott. The tennis team traveled to Cary for the ACC tournament this weekend, and the men faced off against Wake Forest in the first round. They struggled a little bit in singles. Ace Clay Donato played this one right here into the net, and junior Stephen Hardy rolls his ankle right here. Ooh, that looked a little painful. The heels couldn't recover as they lose three to four. On to the women, they made it to the championship on Sat Sunday. The heels lost to doubles point for the first time all weekend. Trying to rebound in singles, senior Kachina Sang with the ace right there. Get out of the way with that one, nothing much jackets could do. Unfortunately, number one, Sanaz Moran whiffs right there and the heels fall three to four. One more ACC championship to cover and unfortunately, it's more bad news. The golf team was in New London, North Carolina during the weekend at the North State Golf, golf Club. The team finished in a tie for ninth, a disappointment after they played so well the past two weekends. Junior Kevin O'Connell finishes the weekend off five over par. Here he is knocking a birdie putt. Get in the hole. Sophomore Jack Fields led the team, finishing in a tie for 15th at one under. But it just wasn't enough. The guys do not have to wait to hear where they'll play their regionals. Last Wednesday, we reported that several Tar Heels' lives could change over the weekend. Today, we know how many Heels are headed to training camp with NFL teams. E.J. Wilson was the first Tar Heel selected, taking the 127th overall pick by the Seattle Seahawks. Experts say by drafting Wilson, the Seahawks gain an instinctive and strong edge player. Wilson is very excited about this experience. I wasn't even thinking about it. I just smacked myself in the forehead really hard. Like, this can't, is it really happening right now? So I had an adrenaline rush once uh, they told me they were drafting me. And once I saw my name on the screen, it was one of the happiest moments of my life. In addition to E.J. Wilson, Cam Thomas went fifth round to the Chargers. Five other players signed as undrafted free agents. Kyle Jolly with the Steelers, Kennedy Tinsley with the Rams, Alaric Mullins and Bobby Rome with the Packers, and Jordan Hemby with the Colts. We wish them very good luck. Next year, the first round could be jam-packed with Tar Heels. Draft expert Mel Kuyper has Marvin, Marvin Austin, Quan Sturdivant, Bruce Carter rated number one at their positions, and Deontay Williams the number two safety. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, the top highlights of the spring semester in Tar Heel Athletics. Every 
everybody hands go up and they stay there and they say yeah and they say there cause all I do is squeeze 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 and if you go in it put your hands in the air make them say that I feel like I can't miss I know they want me to fall but ain't nothing bigger than this so just pass me the ball So, Chris, Lauren, even though the semester is winding down, there's still lots of sports going on. All right. It's truly a great season in Tar Heel sports. Thank you, Simone. Absolutely. Thanks, Simone. Coming up after the break, we'll show you how Operation Building Courage is cheering up pediatric patients. One bear at a time. If you have a story idea, call Carolina Week at 919-843-8292 or email us at carolinaweek at unc.edu. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina 27599. Be sure to check out Carolina Week and Carolina Connection online at carolinaweek.org. I'm starving. What's for breakfast? Guten Tag! Johannes Rums! I bring you arts-enriched raisin brahms, fortified with increased test scores and creative problem-solving skills. It's good! And good for you. Bobby? Susie? Don't worry, that's just the power of the arts! <laughs> <laughs> Feed your kids the arts. For 10 simple ways to learn how, visit americansforthearts.org. Operation Building Courage, a new group on campus, is making pediatric patients at the UNC Children's Hospital feel very special. <laughs> Reporter Carly Stevenson has the details. After a friend gave her a Build-A-Bear to help her through a rough time, UNC junior Mae Shake decided she would pass on the good deed. Shake created Operation Building Courage in the fall, and the group delivers Build-A-Bears to pediatric patients. The group's goal is to make patients' time at the hospital a little easier, one bear at a time. I figured this would be a great way to couple both my passions together, you know, um, doing something for the kids and then pursuing oncology too. Shake and other members work with Build-A-Bear to create bears based on the child's hobbies and favorite colors. Once they've stuffed the bear, they reach into the heart pile, pick out a heart, give it a quick kiss, and then stick it into the bear to complete the process. Members take the builds seriously and dress the bear from head to paw. This month, Operation Building Courage gave Nolan Reed his favorite kind of bear. Reed is seven years old and is in recovery from his ninth surgery. He was all smiles when he opened the box to find a Batman bear. Norland's mom, Avery, was touched by the gesture. It's very hard to go through things like this. And it, it really helps to have people that love children and love everyone to, to make it a little bit easier. Operation Building Courage has delivered more than 40 bears to children. Members are now expanding deliveries to children outside of the hospital system because everyone going through a tough time needs a bear hug. In Chapel Hill, I'm Carly Stevenson, Carolina Week. All right, well, that's all the time we have. And unfortunately, that does it for the semester of Carolina Week. We'll be back with your, new, your campus news in the fall. Thank you so much for watching. Good luck on exams and have a great summer break. Good night.